Good afternoon, chappies and chaparinos, and welcome to Victorian England. Today we will be graced by the right honourable gentleman, the Lord Leuton. Or you can also call him Edward George Earl Leuton, Bolver Leuton, First Baron Leuton. Lord Leuton is quite a fascinating character. You know, being somewhat politically active with the Whigs and the Conservatives. That's quite interesting, isn't it? And he also writes a lot. He's a poet. And indeed, this right honourable gentleman is fascinating, but... In the same time, I won't really cover him all too much. There's another video, framed in the Victorian way, that I recommend you to watch. I will share one clip so you get an understanding how influential Mr. Leuton was. His most famous work is The Last Days of Pompeii, thanks to no less than 10 film versions. He's also responsible for several phrases which are now part of our common language. The pursuit of the almighty dollar the great unwashed. The pen is mightier than the sword. Actually, the full version of that quote is, beneath the rule of men entirely great, the pen is mightier than the sword. Go to that clip and show them some love. The entire video of this is so well made and very fascinating to watch. And it goes into detail of every aspect of Paul Lloyden's life. But I'm going to talk about something that we're going to talk about over and over again in future videos. And it's where the quote, the pursuit of your mighty dollar, comes from. And the book's called Rill, The Power of the Coming Race. Now, we won't go into detail about all the things created afterwards. We do that in other videos. What I wanted to do here is present to you the book, present to you the story, present to you some of the ideas. So this is not going to be the most funniest haha -ha video. This is more descriptive. So take a seat, learn something new, and let's get going. We start the story by exploring some caves. It's us and another man. When exploring these caves pretty deep down, the man falls to his death, and you get knocked unconscious by a rock on your head. You wake up, you see the man next to you, dead, under some rocks. And then you see a giant lizard thing come and eat the guy while you run away. We as the protagonists, we hear certain sounds coming from a distance and the, and the rock formations and everything is starting to look odd. So you keep going that way and then you see a giant opening. The way he describes this is like the Alps. But instead of the large blue sky, it's rocks above you. So you have a rock roof and you're in the Alps. This is how you kind of see the area around you. And everything here is other the ordinary. The fauna, the animals, nothing really makes sense. It's not the same as up top on the earth. Other than exploring and sort of hiding away from the creepy animals, we start to see something that looks like humans. Now they're not really humans, they're odd. So he looks from a distance to try to see what they are, see what type of humans they are, what, what the hell they're doing down here. Uh, we, take, we go closer, we take a closer look, and then one of these human-like creatures sees us and comes up to us. I let the video actually explain a bit how they look like, gives you a bit of an understanding. It was the face of man, but yet of a type of man distinct from our known extant races. The nearest approach to it in outline and expression is the face of the sculptured sphinx, so regular in its calm, intellectual, mysterious beauty with large black eyes, deep and brilliant, and brows arched. A nameless something in the aspect, tranquil though the expression, and beauteous though the features, roused that instinct of danger which the sight of a tiger or serpent arouses. As it drew near, a cold shudder came over me. I fell on my knees and covered my face with my hands. Now, after this encounter, this man is somewhat nice to us. He's confused. He's very confused. He's not showing it in his face, really. The emotions that these people show aren't overwhelming, but you can sort of hint the confusion. He's trying to speak with us in his language, and we just don't understand anything. We try to say something back to him, and he's like, no, I don't, I don't get you. But he does invite us in, and he sort of let us look, which is very nice of him. We as the protagonists actually point out that for these people, us, the humans, are so inferior, it's like less than a pet. Like, I think he calls it a parrot or something like that. It's, they could have just killed us at any moment. The curiosity of this figure did allow us to explore. And what we see is like 
out of this world type of deal. It goes into the more occultic traditions of pyramids and different sort of oriental eastern ideas. But we'll talk more about the influence later on. I just want to go through the story real quick here. After some time we're in the house, we start to see more of these creatures. But uh, when they touch us in the forehead, we fall asleep. And many times during these encounters, that's what happens. We fall asleep. And during the time we fall asleep, us as a protagonist start to get a bigger understanding. And it gives these creatures a chance to explore more and try to understand us more by observing. So after the first time we fall asleep, for example, we wake up and there's just a ton of them in the room. And you're like, oh my God, so many of these creatures. But at that point, it was actually the sages of the society that are there to judge us. What do they do? So it was a discussion when you were asleep the first time on are you a threat or are you not a threat? Because technically speaking, having you there and sort of getting the knowledge of the upper world, there are myths in the society of the upper world, but it's not really believed. It's just like child's tales. But if what you prove is that there is something up above, the state they're in right now, it can mean the death of them. Or it can mean the death of us, depending on what happens. But it's, it, it, it doesn't bode good. So it's a discussion with the sages and, and the man that you met on what exactly you are, if you're a threat, you're allowed to explore, or should we just kill it to kill off the, any you know, rumors that can come from it. But the sages does allow you to live. But with, with certain limitations, should say that. Uh, after you see the sages and they sort of talk, you don't understand what the hell they're saying, you fall asleep once more. And they do this by just touching your forehead, they go yeet, and then, <laughs> and then you fall asleep. You wake up and at that point, these creatures can actually start speaking your language because they found your notebook. And using your notebook, they could actually correlate to some of the pictures you wrote into some of the words. So bird means, you know, bird, but for them it means something else. So with that, they can correlate and they create smart creatures. So they can correlate that to sounds and meanings of words to start using small things. It's, it, it, in the beginning, it's just normal greeting phrases. But over time, you and them start to get an understanding and can talk to each other. And because of this talking, because of the exploration, here is where the story ends in one sense. The story isn't really there. But it's an exploration of this underground society, this utopia underground. You know, utopia, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a utopia myself, but it's a pretty good society. The only story that's there afterwards, that's not a, the explanation itself, is about the hosts, the first guy we met's daughter named C. Uh, she wants to bang you. <laughs> no, she wants to marry you, not, <laughs> not just a sexual deed. But she wants to marry you because, you know, you know it's, a lot of connections there, but it's not really, it's, yeah, no, she's marrying so beneath her, it's ridiculous. So it's sort of like, oh, do I do it, do I not, do I get this, you know, superb race, or do I not, what do I do? He chooses not to, spoiler, but that's the only story that's there, it's, and, and, this, and the thing with this is, the thing that this reminds me of is, like, oh yeah, the coming race have the same issue that the white people have. They like to fuck dogs. <laughs> it's pretty much the same here. Like, for some reason, she wants to fuck this sub, 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 sub creature. Like, a rat, a rodent, pretty much. Sure, they're human-like, but they're so beneath these people. So I don't, I don't get what she found sexually attractive, but <laughs> they have weird ways of doing everything. The two things I want to point out before we go into culture and politics of these people. These people came underground because of a massive flood back in the day. All of these people who lived underground has once before lived up on the surface. When you think of that, us as the protagonists have pretty much the same idea I think you have. They think this is like during the Moses time, or right before the Moses time. This is the antediluvian times. This is from... Adam and Eve's throw out of the Garden of Eden to Moses' time because the angels actually came down to earth to have a sexual relationship with the women here and they created like this super race or what are we going to call them, very tall uh, humans that are like giants of sorts that uh, the entire idea of the flood was to kill these people off. So maybe, you know, in, in our protagonist's mind we think, oh, maybe that is who they are. These are the 
mixed with the angels type of deal, or mixed with something in there. But uh, he says, well, something is wrong here, because he said it came down here 7,000 years ago. The Moses flood was 4,000 years ago. That doesn't make any sense. But it's still sort of in his mind, and maybe it's some sort of mix with some people stayed up there, or something of the sorts. But it's, it's, it's really hard to say exactly uh, who these people are. But uh, he goes into his probably is, in some regards, why we have certain tradition of the angels. Because it's how they look like, or the Sphinx. So there has been some communication between the two that is in hidden occultic traditions, but isn't really there, so he wants to talk about that more. But then you probably think, well, when it came underground, they became the superhumans or super race. No, that's not true either. Uh, when they came down, uh, there were multiple races. There's still multiple races today, in, uh, in, even underground. And they had fights between each other. And there was actually debates on who was the best race. There were some people who were mixed with toads. Like, oh, maybe they are the better because they have certain, like, smoother skins. And that debate, in some sense, is still going on, but it's not really important. But it was actually when they found the Vril. We'll talk about the Vril soon. That uh, the sort of racial fighting in some regards, ended. So it became the people who controlled real versus the people who didn't, which are the barbarians. There's still some people with an underground civilization that does not control real. They're sort of subhumans, you don't deal with them much. They breed like crazy, they're quite a lot of them, but they're not, they don't have that splendid civilization. And mostly there's no war between the civilized people and those barbarians. But the reason why these people also don't have real is because they shouldn't have it. Real is such a powerful force that if it goes into the wrong hands, it, they could end everything. Think of it as a nuke in that sense. As you might have understood, there's a lot of tradition of like, Egyptian traditions and things like that. The Egyptian tradition I learned is actually because he was inspired by Rosencruzen order, or Rosencruzen, whatever the hell we called in English. Rosencruzen's order in Swedish. Rosencruzen's, I should say. They have weird traditions. I, I have mixed opinion about Rosencruzen's order myself. Uh, they believe they got their tradition from Egypt, and they sort of was from Egypt. So the hidden information that's inside of the, the pyramids, the reason why the Sphinx is there, they have that hidden esoteric knowledge within their occult. That's why they focus a lot on Egyptology. But and they were created in the 1700s, so I don't really think they, they were Egyptian. But regardless, that Egyptology got into the mind of Luton. That's why you see a lot of the Egypt mix. You see a lot of pyramids. And uh, as some people even who believes in this today calls like sacred ge geometry in the pyramids and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, right, well, your occultic beliefs, I guess. While he mixes up a lot in his novel about Egypt and Orient and the rest, one thing he goes into in particular that is very important is he believes that these people's, these people's culture, in a sense, are very similar to what he defines as the Aryan, Aryan culture. Now, what is very important to remember here that the word Aryan uh, is not really the right one in the sense that he uses. He uses the word Aryan from theosophy, which is a sort of romanticized, esoteric, mystic concept of the word, of the, sort of a, the, the best race of uh, humans, but in Actuality, what it means is just a, a, a group, especially the Indo-Aryans or the Proto-Aryans, I think they call them like that, which is a group from the steppe lands that got the horse, went west, south, and a few other places and conquered most of Europe. And like, it's, it's just horse nomads. I say yes, yes. I mean, obviously, I'm ancestors of these people. But in that same regards, if you don't want to romanticize this, it's just people who conquered. So he doesn't talk about like the Indo-Aryan traditions or anything like that, which, I mean, if you look in my Slavic videos, when I talk about the Hyperborean concepts of Neo-Slavonism, or Neo-Slavic ideas, they actually go into Aryan traditions in a sense. It's not fully correct, but they go into actually the folk tradition, versus this is much more an idea of a romanticized whateverness. I don't really know what it is, but it's whateverness. But in the sense that they have uh, sages, for example, that's something you think, oh, well, that's an Aryan idea. So therefore, 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 you can you can imagine what the therefore is. I'm not going to go into it. Right, this video is dragging on way too much. I meant Indo-European as well. It's sort of like 
that if you some people like to call them the European Aryans, which is all fine. It's semantics, nothing to give a shit about. But uh, personally, we have to get along because we're this is dragging on. It's a lot you can talk about here. It's a lot, 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 lot. The entire book. Okay, so the the way I would describe the book, it's the like the fifth book of Moses. It's not a story, but it's just descriptions, and it just goes into the perfect society. If you go into the political aspects of this, for example, yeah, I'm just going to give some ideas. There's a lot more to it, and you could probably just talk an hour just about the politics of this. It's it's quite a lot there, but. Democracy isn't viewed as positive. It's it's okay for children to do democracy, but when you get older, you have this hierarchy of sages and uh, wise men, so you follow that. So it becomes a democracy of the young, and then an, a hierarchy, an autocracy of the old. Sort of how they focus it. They also frame that only young people work, which is kind of funny, but it's kind of how real works within these people. So when you're young, you work, you labor. When you're older, meaning adult life, and get married and have children, you um, can relax. Material possessions aren't really a thing that they care about. It's not frowned upon. If you're rich, who gives a shit? Because it's never about that. Because if you're doing it for another cause. In a sense, how the society is framed is in a way proto-fascism. And, and I don't talk about like the bastardized version of <laughs> post like Amer American post World War Two have described it, but, but actually it's the Giovanni Gentile philosophy of fascism that can I go into, which is that you do it for a collective. But it's not fascism per se, because it's actually do it to strive for the better. So it's not so much about a collective. Strive for the better. Strive to become the best that is possibly your civilization, the best it could possibly be. The entire system is built upon social Darwinism. So, for example, if you get rich, it doesn't matter because you are not doing it for the sake of you being rich. Meaning, you can be rich as long as you are focusing on striving for something better to make the civilization, make these people better than they once were pre previously. Enough strive to this betterness, uh, you know, they can conquer the, the upper world, which is the what they want to do later on, especially because he came down and told them about it, uh, they will come up, and as you sort of talk about, they will come up and kill most people and conquer. And the, the way to describe that, again, because they are so much better than most of it, they actually go into criticism of the current civilizations right now. The protagonist goes into how he views America in a positive sense. So we have a, they, they have a good democracy and yada, yada, yada. But he never liked that. And especially when he says, oh, yeah, and we have this person that's great, this person that's great, you know, Mozart and the rest. They frown upon it. They say that why do you only focus on having a few good apples, you know, a few good people? Why not make everybody a Mozart? Why not make everybody being able to reach the fullest potential of humankind instead of having a system that pushes down most people and then only has a few selected people being able to strive for the better. Now, in the sense, they can go, oh my God, communism. Yeah, no, it's fascism in, in, in that regard. It's fascism of the merit, I could say. <laughs> this is why they have sages as well. It's, it's very hierarchical, traditional myths and tradition is being pushed from a very young age into these people on how they behave, how they should act, follow hierarchies, follow the sages. So when we were discovered, it was such a taboo. So uh, myths is being pushed so much into these people. So the destruction of the myth or the bringing off a more centralized religion can actually destroy these people. So they don't want to destroy the myth. So they're not the best that could possibly could be, but uh, it's there which makes it not communist, which, again, much more right-wing and fascistic kind of sense. But there is no system on Earth that follows this system completely. Materialism is frowned upon, you know, sexual attractions, degeneracy is frowned upon. One thing that's very strong in this is feminism. It's extremely feministic society. It's, it's pretty much more or less ruled by women in one sense. Women are the smart agenda, the loving gender. They have emotions that men can't ever have. So women spend much more time learning. And women also chooses their mates. And a man never flirts with a woman. A woman chooses the man. I don't fully grasp the concept of real, but I understand it's 
quite a lot like electricity. Because in around in this civilization, it's something called like automatons. They are robots controlled by will, but they're not doing themselves, it's not AI. They are like indirectly controlled by somebody in a sort of their consciousness control it. So let's say something is shopping onions, uh, there's actually like energetic commands telling them to chop onions. So technically speaking, there's a person shopping onions, but just in a energetic concept or energetic way. And here is where in many ways, one, many people want it. This, this energy is what people crave, what people want, and it's a very dangerous energy, you know, it can kill civilization. But it can control weather, it can control quite a lot of things around you. You know, this is why later on when the Nazis got along and took it, uh, they changed it so they can control aircrafts, because technically they can. Uh, the wings, by the way, I should have said they have wings, I haven't said that. Uh, the wings that they have is controlled by it as well. It's uh, mechanical wings. And uh, the protagonist actually once tried it on while it's controlled by somebody else. It, it, it didn't work well, but because he can't control it. So he's just like in control of another person's wings. So wasn't really successful, but still interesting. Uh, so I won't go into too much what it is because I don't fully grasp it. So a lot of people are going to be angry about that idea. More than that, I want to end it now. It, I can keep going on for like 20 more minutes, talk about everything. There's a lot of fascinating things here, but I'm not going to dwell on it. And hopefully I didn't ramble too much and you have somewhat of an understanding on what the fuck that was, <laughs> what the fuck the book is about. So we can actually continue talk about other people who use this book as a justification for weird things. Anyways, but that all said goodbye and hopefully this was useful. <laughs> goodbye.